Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 347. Today, we're talking about judo. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your founder for Whistlekick. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio. And I love martial arts. That's really where my bio needs to end. There's nothing else that matters. I just do all this stuff because I love it. So thanks for listening. If you want to shop our products, whistlekick.com, you can use the code podcast15 to save 15%. And you can find all of our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, including transcripts and a whole bunch of other good stuff. Judo. Let's talk about judo. There's some myths about judo. Some of what you think you know about judo might not be accurate. So we did some research. And this is, as far as we can tell, from cross-referencing and fact-checking. This is all true stuff. Judo is known as a modern martial art created by the Japanese educator Kano Jigoro, or Jigoro Kano, depending on how you list the name, in 1882. Judo is commonly known for its throws and its takedown techniques, where the practitioners, also known as judoka, use mats to avoid serious injury. Originally, judo was not an Olympic sport, but it became one in 1964. Techniques such as strikes and thrusts with the hands and feet are prohibited in competition judo, but they are allowed in kata, in forms matches. Like other martial arts, the foundation of judo lies on the principles of, quote, life, art, and science. Kano Jigoro, who was born in 1860 and passed in 1938, was the third son of Keigo Jirosaku and Kano Sadako. Jirosaku's original name was Marashiba Jirosaku, but since he was adopted by his wife's family, he changed his last name to Kano. Kano Jigoro's father worked in a shipping line, but later became a government official, while his mother's family owned a popular sake brewing business. Kano had a comfortable life as a child. Kano's father highly valued education, so he sent his son to private schools. At an early age, around seven, Kano was already learning English, and he was working on Japanese calligraphy and the four Confucian texts, also called the four books and the five classics. In 1873, Kano was enrolled in a private British school. It was here he experienced frequent bullying due to his small, sometimes written as frail body. So he thought he'd find someone to teach him jiu-jitsu. Kano had difficulty finding a jiu-jitsu instructor. During that time, jiu-jitsu was becoming less popular due to its kind of vulgar image. People thought it was really violent. So many of the instructors had stopped teaching. He attempted to ask a few people, such as a family friend named Nakai Umenari, who was the caretaker at their villa, and Imai Genshiro of Kyushinru School of Jiu-Jitsu. All of them refused to teach Kano. Umenari showed Kano some kata, but that was it. It took him several years to finally find an instructor. Kano studied at the Tokyo University in 1877. He learned that many Jiu-Jitsu instructors became bone setters or osteopaths. So he looked for these bone setters instead, and eventually met Yagi Tenosuke. Kano was able to convince Yagi to teach him jiu-jitsu. However, Yagi had no dojo. He then referred Kano to his friend Fukuro Hachinosuke, who had a small dojo and also happened to be an instructor at the Tenjin Shinyoru. That was the start of Kano's journey in martial arts. Fukuda's manner of teaching was more actual practice than teaching theory, so Kano was trained more in randori. Those of you that might not be familiar with that term, it's free sparring. Aside from learning from Fukuda, Kano religiously researched as well on European physical education, sumo techniques, and European boxing and gymnastics. It was around this time that he devised a new technique he called kataguruma, or shoulder wheel, which he used to topple a bigger opponent. In 1880, Fukuda passed away due to illness at the age of 52, and it was still undecided who would replace him as the dojo master. Kano, being the best student in both randori and kata, was asked by Fukuda's wife to take over the dojo. Kano hesitated at first, thinking he wasn't ready to take on such a huge responsibility, but eventually he did accept. Kano was given all the manuscripts from the Fukuda Dojo. After Fukuda's death, Kano had no master, so he decided to enroll at the Tenjin Shinyoru School of Jiu-Jitsu, founded by Iso Matayamon Masatari. The headmaster at the time was the 62-year-old Iso Masatomo, who was a well-known kata expert. Iso refined Kano's katas, and entrusted the randori exercises to his other two best students to teach Kano. Because of Kano's sheer talent and diligence, he eventually became an assistant instructor in Tenjin Shinyoru. In 1881, just one year after Kano's previous master's death, Iso also passed away. 
Kano continued to broaden his knowledge in jujitsu, so he studied several manuscripts from Iso. He also sought advice from masters of the old schools in Tokyo. He invested in jujitsu books that he bought from bookstores that were sold at exorbitant prices. After studying for some time, Kano met the 48 year old Ikubo Tsunotoshi of Kitoru. Ikubo refined Kano's throwing techniques, which he was an expert at. In February 1882, Kano founded his own school and he called it Kano Academy. This coincides with his employment at Gakushun, or Peer School, as a part time instructor. In just a few weeks, his students grew in number and he needed a bigger place. He decided to rent rooms at a Buddhist temple called Eshoji, where he also slept. On June 5, 1882, Kano founded the Kodokan Judo. Kodokan means a place for expounding the way. However, after some time, the head priest of the temple asked Kano not to use the rooms anymore due to the damage caused by the training sessions. Just as an aside, I'm going off script for a moment. You can imagine that, right? I don't know about you, but I've trained in some places where uh, some people have flown into some drywall or cracked some windows. It happens. Kano's first students in this temple were Tomita Tsunajiro and Shiro Saigo. They were also the very first people to receive the Shodan grade, or beginning degree, in any martial art. In August 1882, Kano was hired as a full-time instructor at Gakushin, and his compensation was higher. However, what he was getting was not enough to build his own dojo. He took a stressful part-time job at the Ministry of Education as a translator. The job got him enough money to build his own dojo with 12 tatami mats. The term judo did not come first from Kano, but rather from Tereda Kanemon, the fifth headmaster of the Kitoru. Kano just revived the term in 1884 because he believed that the term jujitsu was not appropriate because of the principles he had incorporated into the art. Kano's principles involved Sirioku, Zinyo, maximum efficiency, minimum effort, and Jita, Kyoi, mutual welfare and benefit. On top of the Sirioku, Zinyo principle, he had his theory called Juyoku Go Seisu. Softness controls hardness, with the following explanation. In short, resisting a more powerful opponent will result in your defeat, whilst adjusting to and evading your opponent's attack will cause him to lose his balance, his power will be reduced, and you will defeat him. This can apply whatever the relative values of power, thus making it possible for weaker opponents to beat significantly stronger ones. This is the theory of Juyoku Go Seisu. Kano removed the techniques that were contrary to these principles because every conceivable technique is allowed in jiu-jitsu. Rather, Kano stressed the importance of technique execution while adhering to these principles. He developed jiu-jitsu into judo, just like the development of bujitsu, or martial art, into budo, or martial way. Therefore, judokas would not only learn the techniques, but the principles that would shape and develop them morally. Moreover, Kano wanted judo to be distinguished from jiu-jitsu because the latter already had a negative connotation on a nationwide scale, as he explained. At the time, a few bujitsu experts still existed, but bujitsu was almost abandoned by the nation at large. Even if I wanted to teach jujitsu, most people had now stopped thinking about it. So I thought it better to teach under a different name principally, because my objectives were much wider than jujitsu. The three basic categories of waza, or techniques in judo, are nage waza, throwing, katame waza, grappling, and atemi waza, striking. Judo classes typically begin with ukemi, or breakfalls, as a sort of conditioning to avoid serious injury caused by throwing. This will train the tori, or taker, to correctly and safely perform the waza on the uke, or receiver. There are different forms of ukemi, including ushiro, ukemi, rear breakfalls, yoko ukemi, side breakfalls, mai ukemi, front, zempo kaiten ukemi, rolling. There are 67 nagewaza in total, and all have three stages of execution. Breaking the opponent's balance, setting the condition to successfully execute a throw, and selecting and executing an appropriate technique based on the conditions. Before performing the breaking of the opponent's balance, you've got to have a firm grip on the opponent. This is called kumikata. Grips can vary depending on the situation, so it's important to devise a plan first to make the kazushi effective. Randori, as defined by Kano, means free practice, though it literally translates to taking chaos. It is a type of practice that simulates an actual contest, and the participants can use whatever wazo, whatever techniques they like. The intensity of randori also depends on the level of expertise of the participants. 
There are two main types of randori, light and hard. In hard randori, participants use more strength to compensate on skill. However, focusing only on power could be disadvantageous as the development of the technical skills could be left behind. Moreover, since it requires more energy, participants will find it difficult to participate in more matches. Light randori, on the other hand, strength is used only when necessary. It's secondary. And as a result, participants focus on refining their technique rather than delivering explosive movements. And since it uses less power, light randori is not only safer, but you can do more of it. Another form of randori is yakusoku geko. It is a prearranged practice wherein the tori and the uke would plan first on the techniques to be executed with the intention of polishing one's skill. In this type of randori, the tori would use taisabaki, or body shifting and control, to perform a nagiwaza to the uke. The uke would use the ukemi to safely land on his back. Then the tori might use his hikite, pulling hand, to hold the strike while maintaining his awareness. I think you know where I'm going. In other systems, this is called one-step sparring or three-step sparring or, well, there are other names. There's a lot going on here. Can you tell? I'm actually skipping over some bits. Not because it's not relevant, but because we went deep with this one. Even deeper than we needed to. Kata, or forms, are prearranged movements, patterns, or exercises of techniques in judo, honestly in most martial arts, where some of them are not permissible in competition and in randori for safety purpose. All kata are practiced with a partner, but in seiryoku, zenyo, kokumen taiku no kata, meaning maximum efficiency, national physical education kata, one of the two groups of physical exercises requires performing alone. The main objective of practicing kata is to get used to the techniques without being too conscious of the detailed steps when executing them, given that the techniques are executed correctly. The ancient techniques are also taught even if they are not already used in contemporary judo, as they do have historical significance. The Kodokan recognizes 10 official named kata. Kano established the Kodokan Judo at the young age of 22, and two years prior to that, Kano had already thought of considering judo a competitive sport if they could find a way to remove the more dangerous techniques. Since then, contests have been a vital part of judo. The oldest forms of judo contests followed the Kahuaku Shiai, or winner stays up, method, where the participants were ordered by size and experience. The winner of each match would stay on the mat while the loser would be replaced by the next in line. The participant with the highest number of wins would be declared winner. In 1899, Kano became a chair of the Dai Nippon Butoku Kai, or Greater Japan Martial Virtue Society, to lay down the first formal rules to be used in jujitsu contests, while also being applicable to Kodokan judo practitioners. The contest duration was 15 minutes, and the criteria for judging were limited to Nagewaza and Katamiwaza. The atemi, the striking, waza, was prohibited. Two epons, points, would guarantee a win, and there were four possibilities in getting one. First, when the opponent was made to fall on their back. Second, when the opponent was pinned or controlled. Third and fourth, when the opponent lost by submission or... No, two kinds of submission. Third and fourth, when they lost by submission. Except for finger, toe, and ankle locks, which were prohibited. These rules were adopted by the Kodokan in 1900, but made some adjustments. For Q grades, lower ranks, all joint locks were prohibited, and for Don grades, the black belts, wrist locks were added. In addition to this, the ratio of Tashiwaza and Neiwaza was set between 70-80% for Q grades, and for Don grades, 60-70. to 70. The rules were adjusted again in 1916, when the Kodokan prohibited the use of leg joint locks, neck locks, and trunk constriction. I don't know what that last one is but I, I'm pretty sure I've experienced it, and it's awful. Kano demonstrated judo at the 1932 Olympics, which was the first time that judo was seen in an Olympic Games event. However, Kano's view on including judo to the Olympics was passive, as he said in this statement. I have been asked by people of various sections as to the wisdom and possibility of judo being introduced with other games and sports at the Olympic Games. My view on the matter, at present, is rather passive. If it be the desire of other member countries, I have no objection but I do not feel inclined to take any initiative. For one thing, judo in reality is not a mere sport or game. I regard it as a principle of life, art, and science. In fact, it is a means for personal cultural attainment. Only one of the forms of judo training, so-called randori or free practice, can be classed as a form of sport. Certainly, to some extent, the same may be said of boxing and fencing, but today they are practiced and conducted as sports. Then the Olympic Games are so strongly flavored with nationalism, 
that it is possible to be influenced by it and to develop contest judo, a retrograde form as jiu-jitsu was before the Kodokan was founded. Judo should be free as art and science from any external influences, political, national, racial, and financial, or any other organized interest. And all things connected with it should be directed to its ultimate object, the benefit of humanity. Human sacrifice is a matter of ancient history. More than three decades later, the International Olympic Committee included judo at the 1964 Summer Olympics, but only limited it to men. However, the pride of Japan, named Akio Kamenaga, was defeated by the Dutchman, Anton Giesink. Giesink was defeated by the Japanese in the 56 and 58 World Championships, wherein Kamenaga also participated, so Giesink's victory was quite unexpected. At the 1968 Olympics, judo was removed by the IOC, among other sports. The inclusion of women in judo in the Olympics started in 1988, was only as a demonstration event, and was officially included as a medal event in 1992. Kano developed judo with safety measures for competition. Even though judo does have dangerous techniques, these are prohibited by the rules established by the Kodokan. Since judo was developed by borrowing techniques and ideas from different styles, as well as from Kano's own invention, he devised it, quote, for physical culture and moral training, as well as for winning contests. The person who practices judo is called a judoka. In English, it pertains to a person of any level of expertise, but traditionally, it only pertains to those who were fourth don or higher. Those below fourth don were called kenkyusei, or trainees. Imagine that for a moment. So anybody below fourth degree black belt being referred to as a trainee. I like that. The person who teaches judo, on the other hand, is called sensei, or teacher. However, it literally translates to person born before another. Sensei is the common honorific for judo instructors in Western dojos, but traditionally, the term is only used for those instructors who are fourth don or higher. The uniform, the judogi, is the term for the uniform used by judokas. It's similar to a karate gi, as they have the same origin. It followed the style of kimono and other Japanese apparel during the early 20th century. Now, judogi has changed over the years, but it's still pretty close to that that they were using 100 years ago. Some changes include the length of the sleeves and the pants, the materials used, and the fact that there are now colors. The judogi is usually heavy and durable, and it's designed to endure the very nature of judo practice, where it gets abused. The obi, the belt, comes in different colors to identify the judoka's rank. The blue judogi is used nowadays, especially in high rank competitions, for easier identification during a match. It was first suggested by Anton Giesink, a name that we just heard about, at the 1986 meeting. However, this idea was opposed by traditionalists because kind of shies away, veers away, I guess is a better way to say it, from the idea of judo as sport versus not sport. And, you know, the idea that white was traditional and that's what should be used exclusively. In Japan, a white judo gi is always used by both competitors and only the belts are changed. For those matches hosted by the International Judo Federation, the IJF, each judo gi has to go through mandatory inspections and must have the official logo of the IJF. And one reason for this is to make sure that the uniform is not too slippery for proper grip. Yes, people will find any way to cheat. The IJF is the governing body of judo for all countries and the one that hosts the World Judo Championships. Originally, it only had federations from countries across Europe and Argentina, but it grew over the years and now includes 200 national federations. Among the members, are the African Judo Union, the Pan American Judo Confederation, the Judo Union of Asia, the European Judo Union, and the Oceano Judo Union. Each of these members has their own judo associations under them. The IJF is also responsible for running the judo events in the Olympics. Its headquarters is currently located in Lausanne, Switzerland, and the current president is Marius Weiser. Currently honorary president is the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Judokas are ranked by their skill and level of understanding through the Kudan ranking system, from white to black, and all the various steps in between. Their ranks are easily identified by the color of the obi, the belt that they wear. The ranking system was developed by Kano, which he based on the Chinese board game Go. Beginners typically wear white, 
and changes colors while they progress. Upon reaching the Dawn Grade, Judokas wear the Kuro Obi or Black Belt. The Judoka would now improve his skills to climb the ladder from 1st to 10th degree. Ninth and 10th degree can only be achieved by practitioners who are promoted by the Kodokan itself. And as of this writing, there are only 17 people who were promoted to Kodokan 10th degree. Originally, the Kodokan did not limit the Don level. According to them, if a person is deserving to exceed 10th degree, there is no reason why he should not be promoted to 11th, and so on. It is, however, different now. The Kodokan has restricted the level to 10 and does not have any plans to nominate anyone beyond that. The latest individual that was promoted was Masao Shinohara in 2017. He was born in 1925. Now, if you liked today's episode, you might want to go back to episode 299, where we go in depth on Jigoro Kano, the founder of Judo, the founder of the Kodokan. While there was some overlap between this episode and that one, that one goes much more into the psychology, the transition of Kano from a small, frail child into a man who launched judo and had such a tremendous impact on martial arts. Not just judo, not just Japanese arts, but pretty much everything that's come since. If you want to check out our products, you can find them at whistlekick.com. Don't forget, code PODCAST15 to save 15%. And you can find our show notes, including transcripts and more, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Email me if you want, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and find us on social media. We put a lot of fun stuff out there thought-provoking, entertaining stuff that you want to see. Trust me. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We are at Whistlekick. That's all I've got for you today. I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.